So let's go ahead and get underway with this annual presentation of the State of Online Learning in Oklahoma 2023. If you're new to the summit this year, I just want to put it out there that this is a presentation that you can expect to find every April coming out of the state regents, just ultimately letting you know what's happening within online education, announcing our online excellence award winners each year, also discussing some online learning trends that we've collected from our data system, in addition to NC Sarah and iPads. In addition, at the end, I'll discuss an emerging opportunity that we have coming available with a new group called the Oklahoma Education Commission that's working across all educational agencies within the state of Oklahoma. So let's go ahead and get underway with announcing our 2023 Oklahoma Online Excellence Award winners. The first awardee that I'd like to announce is the Accessibility Award. This recognizes achievement and professionalism within the realm of digital accessibility for online and on-campus learning. I'm honored to recognize this year Kara Stanley as the winner for this award from the University of Oklahoma's Office of Digital Learning. Congratulations, Kara, on the Accessibility Award. Well deserved. The Teaching Award for this year, which recognizes excellence in pedagogy within online education, goes to Dr. Nicole Miller at the University of Central Oklahoma's College of Business. Congratulations, Nicole. Very well deserved for the Teaching Award. The Innovation Award recognizes innovation. So again, emergence of new ideas and revisiting of current practices within an institution. And I'm very honored to recognize former colleagues of mine from the University of Central Oklahoma's IDEA team, which is led by Mr. Robert Wall at the Center for E-Learning and Connected Environments on that campus. Congratulations, Robert and the IDEA team. The Individual Leadership Award this year goes to a person I think that most of the people on this call are familiar with and really has shown an excellent ability to lead state level initiatives as well as initiatives within her own campus at Southeastern Oklahoma State University. So sincere congratulations to our colleague, Crystal Smith, who is also currently serving as the chair of our Council for Online Learning Excellence for this academic year. Couldn't have picked a better candidate for this award. The Team Leadership Award for this year, which again recognizes leadership and excellence of online education with a unit, division, or team level entity on a campus, goes to the Oklahoma Mesonet Outreach Team. This is actually a joint project that is housed on the University of Oklahoma's campus and in co collaboration with Oklahoma State University. And Mesonet serves, again, as they say in their logo, as Oklahoma's weather network, informing us again of how to stay safe, uh, which again, the night that we've all experienced yesterday, uh, we need individuals like this more than ever. Congratulations, and again, well-deserved to the Mesonet Outreach Team members. The last award, which is actually new for this year in 2023, is on Open Education Impact. This award was recently designed and launched by the OER subcommittee under Cole to recognize achievements in open educational resource development and advocacy in the state of Oklahoma. As we'll discuss through the project outlines here just momentarily, OER is growing in Oklahoma uh, exponentially this year, and I'm very honored to recognize from Oklahoma State University, Dr. Kathy S. Miller as the first awardee for Open Education Impact. Kathy has been a pillar of OER strategic planning and development in Oklahoma higher education since I came on board in this position. We would not be where we are today without the leadership of Dr. S. Miller and the OER committee that we have under Cole and really being able to replicate some of the wonderful things that she's done on campus at Oklahoma State University. So congratulations again, Kathy, for winning this initial award for the first year for Open Education Impact in 2023. Once again, I hope you'll join me in a virtual round of applause for all of the award winners this year. This award set is actually chosen by the chairs of committees for the Council for Online Learning Excellence. So it is actually a peer evaluated and driven awards process that's ultimately facilitated by the state regents. Each of the awardees this year was extended an invitation to join us at no cost tomorrow for the Learning Innovation Summit at Rose State College. They will also receive a plaque that they can share in their office environment to showcase the award, a digital credential from the state regents, as well as being recognized at the May 26th meeting of the state regents, where we will actually read out a narrative and fully discuss the accomplishments and nominations of these individuals. So you can expect to hear more news about our awardees as we move on and conclude the spring semester heading into summer. 
shifting gears just a little bit to the online learning trends. So every year, the state regents through the unitary data system are able to assess at the state level in Oklahoma higher education, the impact and trends for online learning. The data set that we're looking at for this year is going to consist of reports from fall of 2017 through summer of 2022. So again, academic years 2018 through 2022 over a five year period. We're gonna begin by talking about the offering of programs and really ultimately by degree type or certificate type that's available within the system. So how many in this most recent year programs were available within each of the degree or certificate categories that we have? You can see that bachelor's degrees had 19.62% available of the total offerings, while master's level programs and associate's level programs ultimately had 35% of their offerings available in online format. Certificate programs as well as post back programs uh, again, fewer number of offerings there, uh, but with certificate programs, 7% of them were only available online, whereas with the post back programs and post master certificates, 45% of those offerings were available online. So you can see even within perhaps the graduate level, there seems to be growth within online education and program offerings, which we'll see demonstrated, I think, further on as we discuss some of these other trends. We often ask, how do success rates compare for online courses versus traditional courses? If you look back over the five-year period that we have available within the data set, you'll notice that both online and traditional courses generally sit at the low end of the 90th percentile of success rates. We have shown some decreases or differences between online and traditional coursework, generally ranging from about one and a half to two and a half percent over the last five years. So they are fairly close together, but statistically speaking, online students do have a little bit less of a success rate than those that are taking traditional courses on their campus. One anomaly that I will point out, and you will see this permeate through all of the information that I'm going to show, and I really do urge you to kind of reflect and pause, consider the effect of this, is in the 2020-2021 academic year, we had COVID-19 as really the big outlying event there. So consider the impact that that would have had on flexibility of enrollment and offering of online coursework preference of students at that time based upon what was available to them or, again, as a matter of health and safety for them wanting to choose online courses. But again, as we see and I think will happen for the next couple of years as we move forward here, these trends are starting to level out again. So COVID being an anomaly, we're starting to see once again a little bit of a merger back to that 2019 and 2020 rate for success in our courses. Um, so again, looking at 2021 in any of your data sets regarding online education, it's just something that we'll have to take into account, I think, over the next couple of years as we see how these trends are going to end up ironing out. These uh, <clears throat> next figures are regarding the number of students ultimately that are taking online courses within the progress of their degree. So the state regions with the unitary data system actually measure graduates every year for associates holders, ultimately, so those picking up a two-year degree from our institutions, we look at the last three years of coursework that they took leading up to that degree point. For bachelor's degree holders, we'll take the last six years of coursework that they may have taken leading up to the point of graduation. So in every single year since 2017, including obviously the COVID pandemic, 99% of associates degrees holders took at least one online class. So again, pretty much every single associate's degree holder within our system has taken at minimum one online class. Bachelor's degrees are a little bit different with this trend. From 2017 to 2019, 94% of bachelor's degree holders took at least one online class in the last six year period of their coursework. So again, 94% still very high, but there were still 6% of students that were not taking any online classes from 2017 to 2019, but were still graduating. Moving ahead from 2020 and persisting to this most recent year from 2021 to 2022, 99% of bachelor's degree holders have now taken an online class. So again, relatively speaking, every student that has obtained a degree 
in this most recent year has taken an online class at our institutions. That's a major change to say every student within the state of Oklahoma that has a degree from a higher education institution is now taking at least one online class. We are touching every student at our institution. So you may be wondering at this point, how many learners in general are incorporating online coursework? So we can take a look at the percentage that have taken at least one online course over the last five years. You'll notice from 2017 leading into 2019, there was a little bit of stability, if not marginal growth, moving up to 50%. In 2020 and 2021, at least 73% of our earners took an online class, which again, that's coded and marked a little differently there because of it being an outlier year. But once again, what I'll be paying attention to over the next couple of years as we move forward is how is this trend going to iron out? So in 2021 and 22, we had largely pivoted back to, dare I say, regular instruction or regular operations on a campus, yet 66% of students still chose to take at least one online course. So I may argue or hypothesize at this point, online coursework is still going to persist. COVID caused a rupture in the ability and I think interest perhaps in our students for online coursework, and it will persist moving forward. At this point, I think it's interesting to look at how is online incorporation, so students incorporating online coursework into their degree pathway changed by tier since 2017. I'm going to first look at the two-year. There's been a 7% increase within two-year colleges of students taking at least one online course since 2017. So now 58% of students at two-year schools take at least one online course or took at least that in the last year. Look, on the other hand, at the research and regional institutions. Research institutions in 2017 were at 39% of students taking at least one online course. Relatively speaking, 60% of those students at research institutions in 2017 weren't taking any online courses. Same thing with regional, 53% of the students at regional institutions in 2017, so about half were taking at least one online course per year. That has shot up for both tiers of the four-year institutions. 67% or over two thirds of students at the research institutions are now taking at least one online course. Almost 75% of students at regional institutions are now taking at least one online course per year. So again, massive growth that we have seen, even looking at this overall at a system level, there's been an almost 20% increase of the number of students or percentage of students taking at least one online class each academic year. Big growth. Even if we look at residency status by those taking at least one online course, in-state students, international students, and out-of-state students have all experienced an increase of incorporation of online education into their educational plan. How do we look at uh, students taking only online classes? So 100% distance education offerings since 2017, it has still grown across each of these categories. So 30% of students that were in-state residency status, ultimately um, taking only online courses in the academic year 2021-22. 30% of overall students were fully online in 2021-22. That's a massive amount, a massive increase since 2017. At this point, let's talk about how many Oklahomans are fully online students living in this state, but are taking courses out of state. So again, fully online institutions, you may think of schools like Southern New Hampshire University, Arizona, Arizona State University's global online program. Uh, those again, fully online institutions that are out of state. We have actually seen in 2021 from that five-year period, a 41% growth in Oklahomans taking fully online degree programs from out of state institutions. I might argue there's a huge opportunity for us to potentially recapture some of that market through online degree programs that we now have available within the state of Oklahoma at our own institutions. 
How is online only enrollment changed by full-time or part-time status? I think that, again, it's kind of natural the way that we might think about or conceptualize some of these statistics, but the growth is still very evident across these categories. So in 2017, 9% of full-time students enrolled in Oklahoma colleges or universities were taking only online classes. So one out of 10 students that were enrolled at our institutions were fully online. Part-time, even more in 2017 with 34%. Both of these categories though, again, within our most recent year have grown 18%. So one in five students at this point, pretty much, that are full-time are fully online. Almost half of our part-time students are fully online students in this most recent year. And when you combine all the students in the system, we're looking at 30%. So almost one out of three students that's an Oklahoma college or university student was fully online in the most recent academic year. If we break this down by classification since 2017, every single classification of program or student has experienced growth in online only enrollment. Graduate doctorate programs have had a 5% increase in online only students. Master's programs, I think, clearly are taking the win here with 24% of an increase in online only enrollment from 2017 to 2022. Even the traditional undergraduates from freshman to senior have experienced at minimum that six to 10% increase in online only enrollment. This one I think is particularly compelling. So what percentage of students were fully online in 2021 and 22? I'll point out just the two here at the graduate level because again, 10% of doctorate students, doctoral students were fully online while 63% of master's level graduate students were fully online. There's a huge and emerging increasing market for online graduate programs. I don't think that's really much of a mystery to any of us here working at an Oklahoma college or university. But once again, I will point out, paying closer attention to that freshman, sophomore, junior, and senior level, we have, again, almost 22 to 30% of students within each of those categories that were fully online and an average across the system of 30% of students, once again, that were fully online. Looking again at who the learners are coming into our dem uh, demographic umbrella now, you will notice that between 2017 and 18 and the most recent academic year, the average age of students that are taking a mixture of online and traditional courses has largely decreased. While the other categories of students, such as those that are taking only online courses or those that are taking only traditional courses, has largely stayed the same. But again, what this tells me, and going back to the earlier points that we've discussed here, is that the average learner that we have, our average college, traditional college student, if there is such one today, is decreasing in age and incorporating more online courses into their learning pathway. So looking at where our students are actually going, uh, the state regions ultimately do measure retention of students, both within individual institutions and seeing if they actually stay within the state if they transfer to another institution. Retention has increased ultimately in, in all categories across the board since 2017. Traditional students are still the most retained at their institutions. What this ultimately tells me is that as online program administrators, we still have room to grow in retention strategies for students in our programs, trying to make sure that they adhere and continue at our own institutions instead of enrolling elsewhere. So again, 65% of students that took at least one online course in the course of an academic year re-enrolled at their same institution the next fall. 50% of those students that were taking only online courses re-enrolled at their institution in the fall. While again, those that didn't take any online courses, 71% of them enrolled at their own institution in the fall. Retention rates in Oklahoma <clears throat> are a little bit better in some cases, I think, than individual rates at institutions. So 70% of those students that took at least one online course were retained within the state of Oklahoma, 
with a, whether at their own institution or moving to another Oklahoma college or university. The online improves about 5%, uh, with 55% of those retained within the state. Whereas once again, the strongest figure that we have here is those that were enrolled in only traditional coursework with 76% of those. So three out of four of those students retained persisting within the state system. So that concludes ultimately the uh, kind of data and trend session uh, component of the session. And we're gonna shift gears just a little bit to discussing some of our online collaboration groups. Uh, ultimately, we have three groups that work in tandem to, with one another across the state uh, and really do try to support not only quality in online education, but collaboration and innovation. And the online uh, Council for Online Learning Excellence was started in 2015, uh, ultimately as a product of the Online Education Task Force and the Task Force Report on the Future of Higher Education to bring about greater collaboration <clears throat> and scaling up of online education in the state. I'm very honored to have the opportunity to work with Crystal Smith from Southeastern Oklahoma State University as our current chair for this academic year. And the members of COLE actually do elect a new chair from the membership body each year. Uh, so we'll go through that process once again in the summer to determine who our chair for the upcoming year will be. COLE currently has 127 members that are at Oklahoma's colleges and universities serving on seven subcommittees. This includes Accessibility, which has 43 members and is led by co-chairs Dr. Pamela Lauterbach from Northeastern State University and Ali Sharp from Langston University. We have the Advanced Technologies Committee with 39 members, led by Simon Ringsmith of Oklahoma State University and Alicia Reidenauer of Southeastern Oklahoma State University. The newest group of coal that was actually just established within this academic year is the LMS and Tools Group with 30 members now led by Margot Gregory from Cameron University and Dr. Amanda Cassie from the University of Central Oklahoma. There is actually going to be a session offered, I believe led by Amanda and possibly Margot and some of the other members of the committee discussing what the LMS and Tools Committee is and the opportunities that it offers to Oklahoma faculty and staff. There are also work groups that are supported by the LMS and Tools Group for each of the major learning management systems that we have in the state. So there's a, a Oklahoma Canvas working group, Oklahoma Back Blackboard working group, as well as working groups for the other LMSs which we have, including Moodle and D2L. We have an Open Educational Resources Subcommittee, which is actually the largest group now with 58 members on that sub one, uh, subcommittee. Once again, led by Dr. Kathy S. Miller of Oklahoma State University and Ann Rea of Oklahoma City Community College. We have a policy group that is actually on ad hoc status right now with 22 members. The professional development group, which once again was responsible for organizing this conference with 40 members led by Lisa Friesen of Southwestern Oklahoma State University and Dr. Kathy Earl Wilcox of Oklahoma City Community College. The final group, which is one of the more recent and newer ones that we have, is Student Success, which now has 29 members and is led by Jenny Maple of Southeastern Oklahoma State University and Michelle Owens from Oklahoma State University Institute of Technology. So each of these subcommittees meets on a monthly basis throughout the academic year to collaborate, make plans, and actually come up with projects that can benefit us on a statewide level. New members are invited to join COLE in one of two ways. You can obtain a nomination from a current COLE member, or you can request a letter or email of support from your president or vice president at your institution. If you're interested in joining COLE or would like more information, I welcome you to drop a note in the chat or email me at online at osrhe.edu, and I'd be happy to connect you with an individual to discuss. One of the current projects that has been underway through COLE for a number of years now and has actually grown to two events each year are annual summits. So each spring we offer the Learning Innovation Summit, which is happening right here and now, organized by the Professional Development Committee, either targeting late March or early April for the event and focusing on two or more days that offer multiple tracks and topics available under the gigantic umbrella of online education. 
We now also have in the fall an Open Educational Resources Summit that is organized specifically by the OER committee under Cole and takes place in mid-fall, generally around October, because there's an open education advocacy kind of period that takes place there. Our OER Summit is generally virtual and takes place over one or two days and focuses largely on the tools used to develop, create, and adopt OER, case studies from faculty and teams at our institutions, as well as opportunities that are available from the state regents, the OCO, as well as other entities at the time. For both of these events and really any COAL event that is held virtually, you can always view recordings in our webinar archive at ocolearnok.org. A future project that I am particularly excited about is that COAL will be launching a series of online student advocacy scholarships beginning in this next academic year and inviting students to join us in fall. The members of the Cole Accessibility Subcommittee requested financial support from the Online Consortium of Oklahoma, which I'll talk about momentarily, to invite online students to participate and provide feedback to the subcommittee groups that exist under Cole. Applications will open for this opportunity for fall in late summer once we get this mechanism set up. And ultimately, during each academic year, beginning with 2023 and 24, we'll have 14 $1,000 scholarships available, which will cover multiple, multiple types of interactions, including mentor-mentee fellowships, engagements of professional development, as well as student advocacy and promotion activities. So open to undergraduate and graduate students, targeting those that are largely fully online to, again, really synthesize the gap sometimes that occurs with the communication between us and the learners in our programs. The next group I'm excited to discuss is the Online Consortium of Oklahoma, which has been in existence since 2018. OCO is currently led by Lisa Friesen from Southwestern Oklahoma State University as our 2022-23 chair. OCO currently has 26 member institutions, and each member institution pays dues to the consortium to support collaborative projects like the student advocacy scholarships I've just discussed. I highly encourage you to find your institution listed here and reach out to your representative for a conversation if you're curious about OCO, what the opportunities are available to your institution and you individually as a faculty or staff member, and to see if there are any opportunities to support the work that's happening in online education on your campus. I would also like to point out that we did add another member to the consortium for this most recent year, welcoming Oklahoma State University, who is represented by Dr. Kathy S. Miller. But once again, the individuals that you see on this call are online advocates at your institution. If you have questions, if you have ideas, things that you really want to share or see happen at your institution, these individuals are most likely some of the best candidates that you can discuss that with. So reach out to them, make a relationship with them if you have that opportunity to do so. One of the current projects that's underway through OCO that once again is a collaborative and shared investment by its members is a series of technology pilot implementation grants. OCO actually opened up an opportunity to all 26 member institutions this year to opt in to receive $5,000 of support funding to try out a new technology. So we ended up having $76,000 of funds dispersed to the institutions that you see listed there to pilot a new tool ultimately for this year. So what you're going to see coming out is a series of managed contracts as well as studies that are available on how these tools have impacted the experience of online education. So we're seeing explorations of tools like Harmonize, which is an online discussion enhancement platform. Simple Syllabus, which brings standardization to syllabi on campuses and more accessibility. Uh, quality matters. So some institutions have taken an opportunity to actually learn how to assess and review their online courses. We've had some institutions opt into doing camera toolkits so one which is taking advantage of a 360 camera in studio and another one which instituted Zoom teaching toolkits for their faculty. We've had some other institutions that are taking an opportunity to try out some accessibility remediation tools with Yuja Panorama, as well as others that took the opportunity to take advantage of cybersecurity initiatives through the Know Before platform, which will be distributed to all students, staff and faculty on a campus. So I encourage everybody that's on here, if you're not familiar with OneNet, 
to visit their website and explore the managed contracts web page. We actually have a number of managed contracts that are under development right now, uh, including some for Tutor.com, Harmonize, Simple Syllabus, and others that we've curated throughout the last couple of years, including for remote proctoring systems, video conferencing platforms, learning management systems, and other items. Uh, one that ultimately has the ability to contract on behalf of our institutions and save money on commonly used technologies. So again, through collective investment that OCO has made here, we're trying to research what the best tools are and best negotiations that we may want to make with select vendors for our system. Another project that's been led by OCO this year through financial support of the state regents are open educational resource grants. We've been able to make $50 OER 101 training awards available to individual faculty as well as staff that support curriculum development and design of distance education courses this year. To date, my understanding is that we still have a number of those awards available, so please feel free to visit the link that's on the screen, which is bit.ly slash 3MROFVE and check out that opportunity. We also have OER adoption grants still available for faculty that are teaching with OER in spring or summer 2023 courses. The deadline to apply for those particular grants is May 15th, so there's still plenty of time, even if you're teaching a spring course that's about to end with OER, to get some funds and recognize the work that you've done. We have grants ranging ultimately from $500 all the way up to $3,000, which include opportunities for whole adoption of existing OER, remixing and revising two or more resources together, or fully authoring your own work that you want to license with a Creative Commons attribution. For those faculty that may have already received a grant from us, or those that are interested in these other three types, we also have a standalone or add-on grant to develop ancillary materials that will be licensed with a Creative Commons attribution. To date, we have actually issued $45,000 in faculty OER grants for 39 projects since this last May. We still have plenty of funds left to issue to faculty teaching with OER in spring or summer, so I highly encourage you to take advantage of that opportunity, or if you know faculty that are already doing this great work with OER, let them know that there are some grant funds easily available and obtainable from them through the state regions. I'd also like to point out for this particular project that Kathy S. Miller and Christina Colhoun from Oklahoma State University will be leading a session during the summer on how to apply for the OSHRI OER grant opportunity. So very quick rundown of what these opportunities are and the paperwork ultimately that's required to obtain these funds. So feel free to check that session out if you have a chance to do so, either live or on, on demand later on. The next group update that I have is out of our Oklahoma Quality Matters Consortium. So each year, the state regions fund a system subscription to Quality Matters, which allows any college or university within Oklahoma, including those that are private institutions, to take advantage of an affiliate membership type, which actually reduces the overall rate that an institution pays by about 50% to Quality Matters. We also have an opportunity being associated with a consortium to provide updates relevant to Quality Matters and collaboration among our own institutions. Quality Matters has released a couple of important updates for those that are a part of the member institution or for those of you that are just kind of privy to what's happening in online education. The Quality Matters rubric, which is right now in its sixth edition, will be revised and updated to the seventh edition effective July. All certifications that individuals in our system have gained, whether that be applying the QM rubric, being a facilitator, or the peer reviewer certification will have to be recertified, which may constitute charging a fee from QM. Support will be available for this. We're working on that with our coordinators right now. Quality Matters has also increased the membership fees for the next billing cycle. Uh, each of the Quality Matters coordinators, which we have 27 of them now at our state system institutions, have been notified of this change. So we have actually grown in the number of institutions throughout our state system that are using Quality Matters now. Uh, Southwestern Oklahoma State University with Lisa Friesen now being their Quality Matters coordinator. And then Northwestern Oklahoma State University 
with Jake Bodecker and Dr. James Bell being the coordinators there, uh, again, have been welcomed. And then the University of Oklahoma College of Nursing, which was an independent Quality Matters member, joined our consortium this year with Dr. Tony Coslow as the coordinator there. But again, if you're interested in Quality Matters and being able to use that in your online course, or if you're in a role at your institution where you may want to be considered a peer reviewer or possibly even facilitate some workshops, feel free to talk to these individuals that are your coordinators and see the support or opportunities available for you there. We do have facilitated workshops that are available because of the state system subscription that's facilitated in Oklahoma. And I would like to express a note of appreciation to the individuals listed on the left who are our active facilitators that teach the Applying the QM Rubric Workshop, Designing Your Online Course Workshop, and the Improving Your Online Course Workshop. So that includes Joy Bauer from NEO, Jennifer Campbell from TCC, Kay Daigle from Southeastern, Dana Linden Burgett from Rose State College, Amy McCain from Murray State College, Lisa Restivo from Cameron University, Kelly Semeski from Eastern Oklahoma State College, Kathy Earl Wilcox from Oklahoma City Community College, and Tamara Williams Diaz from OSU OKC. We have shifted our workshop offerings to be offered now three times per calendar year. We did just have a series of workshops that have concluded in the month of April, but if you're interested in enrolling in one of these upcoming opportunities, we'll have workshops available in July and late October, early November uh, for general offerings there. One of the benefits that we also incur by offering dedicated Quality Matters workshops is that we can save a lot of funds for our institutions and individual faculty on the registration fees. We actually had 69 individuals complete the APP QMR workshop in this last calendar year, 84 individuals completing the Improving Your Online Course workshop, and 86 individuals completing the Designing Your Online Course workshop. Collectively, compared to what these individuals would have had to pay if taking these workshops directly from QM, we have saved our institutions over $20,000 in registration fees. So it's a substantial difference ultimately that we can reach uh, I would argue not only with the cost savings, but with the outcomes and networking that we can really inject uh, by offering Oklahoma-focused workshops with faculty from multiple institutions working together and discussing online course design. That actually concludes the State of Online Learning in Oklahoma presentation, finished a little bit early today, which is good. I would invite everybody on this call today to please check us out and stay in touch with us by visiting ocolearnok.org or me emailing us at any time at online at osrhe.edu. I'll go ahead and pull the screen share down and see if there are any questions before we conclude the session. Uh, but otherwise, the next session does begin at the top of the hour at 11 o'clock here in Zoom events.